Well, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My presentation is called Long Live Resistance. About 20 years ago, I started my inaugural address when I was appointed a professor at the Technical University of Lausanne as follows. We are living in a world today whose further existence is in danger, and we do see, see the evidence everywhere. In a society striving for democracy, war has been and still is a structuring factor. I believe that the university is to be blamed for the events we are witnessing today. It is therefore obliged to publicly investigate the human forms of life under the aspect of its moral qualities. As long as a university graduates are intellectually not aware of the facts they need to be conscious of in order to become responsible and active citizens in order to truly democratize the country. The main task of intellectuals and teachers will be to do just this. I would therefore like to underline that the purpose of architecture lessons does not only consist in training capable and excellent architects, but even more to produce critical intellectuals with an ethic awareness. End of quote. Now, this statement is meant to underline that architecture is not a neutral discipline in society. According to my thoughts and my action, when I design and when I teach are always based on a political and ideological attitude, which is oriented at general, extensive, comprehensive socialist efforts and a utilitarian idea of our performance and consumption society. Within this particular ideological perspective, however, I have to underline that architecture needs to be an autonomous discipline. I think architecture matters because it can influence the circumstances in which societies live and act. However, architectural design does not play a political role immediately. Nevertheless, I think that architecture and political commitment are closely related. So you need to accept your responsibility. You need to deal with the form, and you will find the human being in it. That's another important motto. And I have tried to show to my students what this means in the following systematic architecture at your left, society and politics at your right. So architecture strives for permanence, but it does not strive for the volatile, whereas society and politics strive for the volatile and not for permanence. Architecture thus is an anti-efficient thing, whereas society and politics strive for maximum efficiency. When we try to understand 
the system of architecture in our times by referring to the most famous architects. We recognize that there are two columns, actually. Most of the well-known architects often work for public themes in our current society, oriented at the major value of consumption, i.e., they work for organic and functional projects. The second group of architects would then rather be categorized under the title of society and politics. There is another important aspect we need to see with respect to the relationship between our discipline, human beings, and nature. There are lots of sayings I use in my teachings, and this is what I also wrote in my very first presentation in Zurich at the Technical University, and I will quote some important persons in the course of my presentation. But in order to get us started, I would like to suggest two aphorisms which have not been written by me, but by Carlo Cataneo, an important um, intellectual from Milan. He worked hard in the early in the, the early 20th century in the Tessin region. He also worked on a correction of the Tessin River, and he tried hard to improve the situation of the Magadino. And he also worked on a project for the Gotthard train system. And then I would like to quote another important person and a friend of mine, Paolo Mendes da Rocha, a Brazilian architect in Sao Paulo, who received the famous Pritzker Prize a number of years ago. Now, Catania says, each place can be distinguished from wilderness by comprising major remnants of human efforts. The ground is thus not a work of nature, but it's the work of our hands. It's an artificial home. Mendes is clearer in his approach. He shows the picture you see on the screen, and he says, nature is dirt. In order, in order to conquer his habitat, man needs to develop in the scope of a double aspect, in the context of a double aspect, which determines the confrontation that marks his existence. On the one hand, nature provides him with all goods, the goods he needs in order to survive. On the other hand, he tries hard to make nature become culture. The city is the very last moment of this confrontation today. Thus, I think that the city is the natural home of human beings. And thanks to the human effort, the city contains the fire of the volcanoes, the sand of the desert, the jungle, trees, flowers, animals, nature as a whole. He who climbs the mountain is happy in the mountains because he knows that the city is behind the horizon and a sailor is happy on the sea because he knows that the city is behind the horizon. This is a very dynamic way of understanding landscape and it's the antithesis of all theories based on adjustment adaption and integration theories you will find still today in different agencies charged with the protection of landscapes and monuments, but you also find this dynamic understanding in urban planning projects today. 
architecture thus does not think its task is the integration of a building into its setting or environment, but it's about about building a new place. When talking about the city, we think of the historical city. The city, therefore, is the most significant event still today. The two concepts, the historical city and modern architecture, are closely connected. Without modern architecture, the historical city would not mean anything. The historical city is thus an active part of the design and layout of the new city. The history thus becomes an important element of architecture. And to not invent anything means to recover everything. Another important reference for um, the design is what we call Neues Bauen, new building, which focused on the apartment, first of all. This was a period um, of many experiences. And connecting with this tradition means to refuse and reject vulgar functionalism, which was um, the concept meant at the time when the slogan form equals function was coined. The aqueduct lives as soon as it does not carry water anymore. The analysis is therefore also and always part of the project against a consumer's understanding of the world. We have to find new solution in order to discuss once again the values of architecture that have long been forgotten. And I'm referring to the value of the soil, which is a common good and which is closely connected to cosmic and geographic values. A true meadow reaches up to the center of the earth. To your left, you see yesterday. At the right hand side, you see today. Again, yesterday, to your left, today, to your right. Values including new seasons, day and night, but also the values of primary elements like the sun, the air, light and water are in my mind primary elements without which humankind could not survive and the value of history, of memories and the human effort. What a waste of energy, what an effort in order to get fresh air, to heat, to light. A window would be sufficient. Each intervention means destruction. But if you destroy, be smart about it and be happy about it. That's what I would like to add to the slogan. The light above all. After these synthetic and theoretic ideas, I would like to now focus on the attempt of giving answers. And we are dealing with the long-term perspective of the city first and foremost. Let me show you the Delta Metropolis study made in Holland. It's a project dating from 2001 and to 2003, together with my friend Paolo Mendes da Rocha and Professor Siriani, a professor at the University of uh, Paris, a Frenchman. We 
try to analyze the works made in Holland for the new metro metropolis in Holland. Now, each of us worked by himself, and after one month, we met in a video conference. And we agreed, after hundreds of analyses concerning Holland, we realized that there were maps of the roads in Holland which stated in which year, what month, what day, what hour, there had been floods. Extraordinary reflections we found on these maps. But none of these uh, ideas or recommendations be had become part of the Delta Metropolis project. Thus, we concluded you could send all the architects involved home. Now, that was the decision we took after having talked about the proposals that had been made so far. Now, afterwards, a competition was organized. Four architects were invited, Rem Kohlhaas, two other Dutch architects, and myself. We were friends with Mr. Barrio Kuden, the chief architect of the Netherlands at the time. He had closely cooperated with me on another project, which is the reason why I was invited to participate in the competition. Now, there was a problem. Because I commented on the, I had commented on the proposals made by Dutch architects, and I carried with me a proposal for the Dutch Delta Metropolis, which I showed to the Dutch. Now, their reaction, they rather showed a harsh reaction, I have to say. They called me a Nazi. They called me a fascist because of the project. And the only reason, and I will show you, the only reason was that I had drawn a circle in the center of Holland. It's a dam. It was meant to be a dam with a high-speed railway system on top, so it would be possible to uh, drive once around Holland within half an hour. Now. The Dutch critics went and said, this is non-democratic. It's anti-democratic. We don't need a circle. We need a thousand ideas. We don't want to have one idea only. And we don't want to have just one idea presented by someone who is not even Dutch. He is a foreigner. So their reaction was a rather harsh one. But I will, still you, uh, I will show you later what happened to these Dutchmen. Now, have a look. I uh, will try and show you the sketches. Now, here you see the center of the Netherlands, and you see right away that there is a circle in the center. This was a political decision taken in the 1930s. The uh, socialists governed, ruled the country at the time, and the socialist government said they wanted to determine the green heart of Holland. This was meant to be a green zone meant for agricultural purposes, for farming, but no city was to be built in the center of Holland. And that's what you see on the map. Amsterdam is what you see at the top, Leiden. The Hague, Rotterdam, Utrecht, almost all 
Dutch cities refer to the sea or are related with the sea apart from Utrecht. So that's what I sort of immediately when uh, I was asked to make a proposal, the green web, as it was called. So I made a sketch, and I wanted to identify all Dutch cities and make sure that they could only grow to a certain extent. I wanted to keep these cities from growing into each other. I wanted to keep these cities apart. And you see that the whole country reaches out into the sea. You see countryside, the city, the green zone, countryside, the city. And the circle identifies the center of the country. And in order to define um, or identify the center, I suggested the railway system, the viaduct. And in order to mark the cities, there should be two towers per city. Why two towers? Now, these two towers would serve a very special purpose. Whenever I do a project, I ask myself one question. If I have two questions, I just drop one. So it's one question per project. Now, when I implemented my project, but when I worked on my Dutch project, I asked myself, is it possible today to design a metropolis in which a human being finds his or her bearings like he or she used to in the old times, in the old cities. That was my idea. So in order to offer orientation in the city, I thought that I would ha have to have the towers because the dam is about 40 meters high. It's, it's not possible to see the whole of it. So I built two towers per city, or I designed two towers per city, so that whoever would want to see the whole circle could climb it in order to see the whole circle. And you would see Holland as a whole. Now, this is one of these dams. This is a dam in Japan. This is the circle and the cities around it. Now, of course, I had a second idea in mind when working on this project. I thought that the cities could also uh, do a bit of advertising for the Swatch watch. Because I, I thought the Dutch would ask me how to finance such a big project. So uh, I called the director, the CEO of Swatch, and I told him my proposal. And I, I, I said, this would be the biggest, the greatest advertising for the Swatch watch in the world. Even astronauts would be able to see it from the cosmos. The airport today is located between Amsterdam and um, the city down there. Which would mean that nobody would see the airport and the fingers of the watch. And that's why I thought the airport should be right in the center of the circle. And of course, from the airport, you would see everything you want to see. And people who arrive by plane get out of the plane and they see the nine cities. However, I, I wanted to produce a Swiss watch. And thus, I had to add three more cities. I mean, these cities are closed off. They cannot be extended. I um, had 
said that per definition these cities must not grow. So if you have more people who want to live in cities, you could build three more cities, which would give us 12. Which would then fit the purpose of a Swiss watch. This is a maquette we did. Now, the authorities and the government were not really happy about my project, as I have told you already. And I knew I would not win. I mean, they had seen my sketches already. I had showed it at a conference before, so they knew there was this project of mine with the circle. Now, four days before I sent my proposal to the Netherlands, the Dutch government sent three Dutch architects to my office in order to have them check out what I was drawing. So they came over and they saw the circle. And I started destroying my circle. And they uh, did what they called a democratic form. And I said, OK. They left. And of course, I started working on my circle again. And I sent my circle to the jury. And then they called me a fascist. And I called me a Nazi. These authorities, they called me a Nazi and a fascist. And that's when I showed the European banner. And I told them I had not known so far that Europe is a Nazi, a fascist state. Europe is a democratic union, right? And I showed them this banner and I said, this is my project, you know? On the basis of my experience, I have to say that I have started to better understand the mythology of the design or layout. And we need to an analyze the word. As at university, you need a lot of time to, an to analyze the project. The most important thing is to know what you want to find or what you have to find in order to understand the project as a whole. Without this project, the life of an architect would not be sufficient or satisfactory. Of course, you have to ask the important question. When I did this project, I was in the Netherlands, and I took an airplane, which took me back to my home within 20 minutes. The projects are usually based on the answer to one single question, i.e., is it possible to design a metropolis in which the citizen can get his or her bearings as if he or she was in an old town. I mean, you need to know where to intervene, and you need to develop the important question, and you cannot have more than one question. As I said, all projects try to answer the questions about the development of the city and, in particular, an answer to the problem of the urban sprawl we are seeing today. This is about the human development of the city, and there are two fundamental assumptions we have to bear in mind when looking at what architects do today. They try to develop a pro program. However, in most cases, these programs don't work. So you need to develop programs at the sites of the planning 
process in order to develop in order to promote the development of a city which is different from what had been intended, which means you don't have to take a decision because the best plan is no plan. The second problem, urban sprawl, needs to be tackled too, and there are no clear statements with respect to the urban sprawl, I'd say. In view of this particular perception, I'd like to suggest an alternative to options. I think it's absolutely necessary to establish spatial limits to growth against the urban sprawl. Within these limits, within these boundaries, however, we need to have maximum densities. The project, for example, I worked on for the Netherlands included boundaries. And I said we should have trees which mark the boundary. In the center of the Netherlands, we see European landscape designers work and they use elements like a perfect lawn in order to grow trees, which is bad. The Dutch needed the meadows, the lawns without trees in order to have wind, because they have windmills. Because of the fact that the country is below the sea level, these mills, these windmills are needed to cope with the water. So I suggested to cut 100,000 trees, which would be in the center of Holland, and to mark, to use them as markers of the new boundaries of the cities around the center. Now, with respect to the long-term approach in the development of the city, I answer with spatially closed architectural designs. In other words, I my answer are the short-term projects. However, within established limits, my design has to allow for maximum flexibility. I, I use one of my aphorisms in order to develop these uh, projects. Architecture is a vacuum. You need to define it, or it's up to you to define it. Architecture as such is empty. Go and define it. And this is one of the places in China. Now, this aphorism makes sense with respect to the historical city. It's uh, enough to think of uh, squares, places, streets, roads um, leading from the buildings into the historic center of the city. It's much more difficult to use it, however, with respect to the city of today day because the empty spaces, the void between buildings is often just a remainder that does not make sense, a useless rest, so to speak, which is one of the reasons why architects today refocus, look at their object only in order to overcome the problem of lacking a context that makes sense or would be useful, like the old town, in order to create in an utmost genuine way the monument of the day. However, since there is no context that makes sense, like a historic city center, the result is nothing but the sum of individual buildings, i.e., is nothing but a further enhancement of the monotony of the city of today. So I need to change my aphorism. Architecture is emptiness. You need to define it. 
Now, I started off with a quote, and I would like to end with a quote. I am quoting the Swiss writer and architect Max Frisch. He was the one I quoted when I gave my inaugural address in Lausanne in 1975. Max Frisch, based on the idea of the failure of enlightenment, and he felt closely connected to the enlightenment, said, at the occasion of the celebrations at his 75th birthday, I quote, science without moral reason and thus without scientific research whose consequences are not to be blamed on anybody is more than a deficit. It's the perversion of the enlightenment that should enlighten and educate us. Enlightenment, education today is a revolt against the superstition, the belief in the technology which antiquates the human being, as Günther Anders says, and which only enhances our powerlessness in view of technology. At the end of the Enlightenment, we do not see, like Kant and the Enlighteners hoped, the independent and rational human being, but the golden calf. And I do feel solidarity with all those who resist somewhere in the world, including resistance against the rule of law as a trick, resistance with the purpose of having the spirit of the enlightenment come true in due time, not as a historic repetition, but through the historic experience, which leads to a new attempt of coexistence of reasonable, rational human being without an attempt to implement moral reason, which can only stem from resistance. There won't be the next century, I'm afraid. Now, an appeal to hope is an appeal to resistance today. Thank you very much for listening.